Yeah. It's your call. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll read a scripture, and this scripture is related to, um, you know, to to the message today. But also, this is a scripture that I would encourage you to pray. Um, and I was reading Charles Finney's this morning from his autobiography. Hold, hold it up. Yeah, I was reading again. I've read it in the past uh, many times. But anyway, I was reading this morning, particularly where he talks about this great prayer awakening of 1857-58. But he mentions he was in Boston and how that the Holy, he's felt moved of the Holy Spirit to pray the promises where God promised to open the windows of heaven and pour out a, like like water, pour out a flood of water upon the land, water being a type of the Holy Spirit. So I'm sure one of the scriptures he was referring to is a scripture that I have been praying lately, and I invite you to pray it with me. Um, it is Isaiah chapter 44, and I'll just start reading at verse 1, although the, the, the essence of, it, of the promise starts in verse 3. But he says, but now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Well, we are his chosen one, so we can receive these promises for us. That's not a replacement theology. That is a reconciliation theology that God has reconciled us all, whatever race we are, to him in Jesus Christ. And Paul says that if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so, but now listen, Jacob, my servant. So that's us also. Israel, whom I have chosen, this is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Now here's the promise. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Water being a type of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that again. This is a great promise. You can pray that over your family, you can pray that over your, if you have a church somewhere, over your uh, community, over your nation, pray it over us. Pray it over God's Word to Women, Hyde International Ministries. Pray it over the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame. God, pour water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground, Lord. Pour out your spirit like a flood in Jesus' name. And he says, and I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. That's your children, your grandchildren. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Boy, isn't that a great promise? You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that is why we must, if we're serious about getting answers to prayer, we, we must delve into the word of God. And pray based on God's word. Pray based on his promises. Hallelujah. Well, today I'm going to speak to you some very powerful truths, biblical truths. But also I'm going to use an example of an event that happened over 100 years, just 150 years ago or more. And I call it the Great Prayer Awakening of 1857-58, which impacted America, Canada, Ireland, our friends in Ireland. I have a segment there of how at the same time there was a, a special revival, outpouring of the Spirit affecting Ireland, Wales, England, different parts of the earth. Because there's no distance in the Spirit. But um, it was a very critical time in America. And um, this revival is God's third, was America's third great awakening. Some people, historians who have studied this, consider it to be the greatest revival that America has ever experienced. But there were some very unique features about this revival. Charles Finney called them peculiar features about this revival. Here are some things, I want to start out by saying, telling you some things the revival didn't have and then what it did have. But I feel like first we should just pause and we should just pray and welcome the Holy Spirit, acknowledge God, acknowledge His sovereignty, acknowledge His power, acknowledge His name, and welcome His presence here in our midst as we are gathered together from many parts of the world on this planet. And we're not here by accident or coincidence. We are here in God's divine plan and purpose. 
when God spoke to me, I guess it's been, I don't know, 12 years ago or so, to, to, he said, I want you to identify yourself with Sue and what she is doing. A pause, and then I heard him say, this message has the power to begin a mass movement from Islam to Christianity beginning with the women. And so we're here on a, di on a divine mission, folks. And so we're so glad that you're a part of our lives. And um, Lord, we welcome you today. Almighty God, we acknowledge you as the sovereign Lord of this universe. And God, we are your people. And Lord, it is our desire to cooperate with you here on earth, that we will be your people here on this planet. And Lord, that we will be your people, that we will know your heart and that we will express your heart and we will speak your words, O oh God, not our words, not our desires, but Lord, that our heart, our minds will be one with you. And God, we will adequately represent you on this earth. And thank you, Lord, today. I pray, Lord, that everything that is said and done today, that everything that I say in this message, I pray that it will honor you and be for the good of your people and will advance your cause and kingdom in the earth. And Lord, and I pray for all of our friends out there that are connected right now. I pray that this will be a very special day for them, that Lord, this will be a time when you will renew their faith, when you will renew their hope, when you will renew, oh God, the vision that you placed in their hearts, some of them many years ago, Lord, that they will experience a new hope, a new faith, and a fresh vision for who you are and for doing your will in the earth. Thank you for doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. This great prayer awakening that in my subtitle I say that ended slavery and saved America from total ruin, from being broken up. This prayer revival had some very peculiar features about it. Here are some of the things they didn't have, and of course I'm relating to this to what is currently popular in at least charismatic Christian circles. They had this prayer revival, I'll just say it started with just a simple one person who was a businessman who claimed no special gift or call. There was no famous revivalist, pastor, or preacher. There were no singers or musicians. There was no worship team or praise band. There was no apostolic council to be their covering. There was no prophetic presbytery to give them an impartation. There was no breaker anointing. They knew nothing about an Amos 13 season. They didn't know anything about being the Joshua uh, generation. <laughs> So funny. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> All of these things they knew nothing about. They didn't have any of these things. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it reminds me, it makes me think. Here's what it makes me think of. During the Christmas season, uh, Sue saw somewhere advertising a, a huge Christmas tree at the Texas Speedway, which is not very far from us. So we took a drive by there uh, one, one evening. And it's actually a real tree, a real, I guess, a pine tree, and they had decorated it for Christmas. You know, they had the tinsel and the stuff on there. But actually, all of those lights and tinsel and, and bells and balls and colorful balls had nothing to do with the health and the growth of the tree. In fact, if those things were left on it, it would probably be detrimental to the tree's growth. All the tree needed to grow was some sunshine and water. And in Christianity, there's all kinds of bells and tinsel and lights and so on. There's all kinds of outward, uh, sensational, exciting, entertaining things that actually contribute zilch, zero, to our spiritual growth. <laughs> yeah. And in this prayer revival, what I see is God was able to take them back to the very basics of Christianity and those things that actually contribute 
to spiritual growth and to the working and to the moving of the Holy Spirit. This prayer revival, it began with a man named Jeremiah Lanfear. He was a 48-year-old businessman, and uh, he lived in Manhattan, New York. And it so happened that at this time there was a great influx of immigration uh, to America and particularly into New York City. One source that I read said that 18, 1,800 people per day were coming into New York City. And uh, many of these people were from, actually many were from Ireland, many were from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Many of them did not have a personal relationship with Jesus. Many of them were, were, uh, had a, a, for, a formal outward religion. Many of them were Catholics but knew nothing about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, many of them were, were very uh, crude uh, in their mannerisms and so on. And in this area of Manhattan, there had been a great influx of, of these new people and, and new businesses. And many of the churches had moved out of the area because of this. But this one particular Dutch Reformed church called the Old Dutch North Church, they decided to stay. And they asked this businessman, Jeremiah Lanfear, if he would be like they called it a home missionary. And if he would go out and visit these people, talk to them about the Lord, invite them to church, hand, give them, they call them handbills, but we would call them gospel tracts. So he started doing this. He'd never been to Bible school. He had no training about this, but he did have a heart for God. Oh, my friends. <laughs> oh, whatever you have, may we have a, a heart and a passion for God, for his will, for his word, for his truth. And so Jeremiah Lanfear, he was out daily visiting people, knocking on doors, going into businesses, talking to them about the Savior, giving them gospel tracts, inviting them to church. After three months, the excitement had worn off. And he was feeling a little down because of the spiritual indifference and also even the outright rejection that he had been experiencing day after day and week after week. But somewhere in his going about his daily duties, the thought came to him, not an audible voice from heaven, not some great vision, just a thought came to him. Why not have a prayer meeting during the lunch hour when business people here in Manhattan are, they have an hour off for lunch, why not announce a prayer meeting and invite them to come and pray for all of these unconverted, for these non-believers that are all around you. Why not invite them to come and pray? It was just a thought. But that thought turned out to be the key. Now here's something else I want to say, folks. This is so important. God does not always thunder from heaven when he wants to speak to you. He does not always give you some dramatic vision. He does not speak always with an audible voice from heaven. Those things can happen, but those are not the norm. Sometimes just a what seems like a gentle nudge or a thought can result in incredible ramifications. I remember years ago, Sue and I were in a place where we were facing an incredible financial challenge. We were, it was like we were on the verge of losing everything and I was praying. And there was a thought, it was just like a thought went through my mind. But I tell you, I acted on that thought and a few days later, I had asked God, I had figured out what we needed and I'd asked God for $6,500. And it was after this, I had this thought, <laughs> just a thought, no vision, nothing dramatic, just a thought. I acted on the thought and a few days later, I opened the door and there was an overnight FedEx package with $6,500 in it. Hallelujah. But see, here's the danger. What is happening in so many circles today in the charismatic movement, they're making, they're, they're, they maybe without trying to, but they're making 
the unusual, the norm, the voice from heaven, the dramatic vision, the angelic visitation. They are making these things the sensational, the norm. And you know what happens when people are always looking for the sensational, they miss the supernatural workings of the Holy Spirit. When he comes in those gentle nudgings or just giving a thought, they totally miss all of that. So yes, God does those things, but those things are not the normal way in which he leads and guides. Jeremiah Lanfear, he just had this thought. Why not have a prayer meeting and invite business people to come and pray for all of these lost people around that you're concerned about? So, the church that had hired him, he talked to them. They said, yeah, we'll give you uh, a room on the third floor. Not the greatest location, third floor. <laughs> So he took this large room that would, I understand would accommodate maybe a couple of hundred people. He made up some handbills. He put them on businesses. Now this is in Manhattan, downtown New York City. On businesses around the area, put one on the front church door and invited them to come to the third floor during their noon hour and pray. On the first day, he was there sitting. At 12 o'clock, nobody was there but him. He sat and he prayed alone for the first 30 minutes. My friends, when God gives you a commission, <laughs> you may have to start out all alone. You may have to venture out all alone. Jeremiah Lanfear, he sat there. Nobody showed up at 12, but he sat there and he prayed. After a half hour, he heard some footsteps on the steps coming up the stairs. And another businessman joined him. By one o'clock, two other individuals had joined them. And so there was a total of four that day from three different denominations, and they prayed. And they had a reason. The stated reason that they were there was to pray for the lost of Manhattan and New York City, to pray for these new immigrants coming into their city that did not know Christ. I'll say that again. That was the reason for their prayer meeting, the stated reason. Now, they would pray about other things, but their stated reason for coming together was to pray for the lost and particularly these thousands of new immigrants that were coming into their city that did not know Jesus. <laughs> now, when they were praying like that, let me say this, my friends, they were praying very near to the heart of God. For what did Jesus say when he was accused of fellowshipping with sinners and publicans and those kinds of people? Jesus said, I did not come for the righteous. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It was in that context Jesus told the great parable of the, of, the, of the one lost sheep that wandered away from the fold. And he said, which of you? And a lot of these people were shepherds. They were, they were farmers. They, so, so it resonated with them in a way it doesn't with us today. And he told about how the shepherd, and they all knew this is what would happen. He would leave the 99 in the fold. And he would go out on the mountains and the hills and the wilderness looking for that one sheep that had gone astray. <laughs> and when he found the one sheep, he was overjoyed. And Jesus said he would carry the sheep home. And he would tell his neighbors, come and rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And that was an expression of the heart of God. And what it tells us is that God is actively pursuing those lost sheep. God's not back with his arms folded and say, well, we'll see, you know, if they... No, God is actively pursuing, especially if it's someone who has left the full, a, what we would call a backslider. 
I was saved when I was eight years old, not in a children's church, just in a regular service. Uh, as a kid growing up, I had to go to church and I had to sit and listen. And in one of those services, the word of God pierced my heart. And when an invitation was given, nobody asked me to go forward. I got up and I went forward. And I still remember I knelt at the altar and my heart was broken and I wept. And that was the time of my, my new birth. As a teenager, I wandered away. Spent three years in the U.S. Army, but I can remember after I returned home, I can remember driving along the road and people were praying for me. My parents were praying for me. And I believe here's what happens when you pray. When you as a parent, you pray for your children or you pray for, for, for relatives or you pray for a co-worker. Sometimes they may seem to get worse. It's because they're resisting the convicting force of the Spirit of God that's coming at them as a result of your prayers. Because I can remember driving down the highway, wasn't serving God. Outwardly, people probably thought I had no interest in God. But I can remember driving down the highway talking to God and, 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 and tears rolling down my face as I'm talking to God and telling God that I really did want to serve Him. And I believe what was happening, I think of the scripture in Genesis when God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And it says, and the spirit of God, the old King James says, moved upon the face of the deep. I think the, the new King James, maybe the NIV says, he hovered, he hovered over the face of the deep. And the word means it's sort of like a, a, a mother hen sitting on, hovering over an egg, incubating and hovering over it and bringing forth what needs to come forth. And the Spirit of God, as a result of my parents' prayers and others, was hovering over me and incubating over me. And when you pray for the lost, and here's immigration problems all over the world, and I can tell you, my friends, but let me go back. You praying for your family members. You praying for your children. Don't, don't let your faith be in any way affected by how they respond. Let your faith be in God's word and know that as you're praying for them, you're praying in line with the heart of God. For the Son of Man, He came. The purpose in coming was to seek and to save the lost. Those who have departed from the Father's house. Those who are not a part of Almighty God's household. He has come to seek and to save the lost. And as you pray over your loved ones, your children, your spouse, your family, your relatives your co-worker, your boss, whatever the situation may be, I encourage you, pray over them, knowing that you're praying in line with the heart of God, that Jesus Christ is actively pursuing and seeking those lost sheep. These people, they begin to pray. I think, Eddie, uh, when we were talking about this yesterday, yes, it, I was so impressed. These people were not praying for revival. That's true. They didn't start out praying for revival. No, they were praying for the salvation of individuals. They, that's right. Yep. Not for, for revival. Yep. Oh, I mean, that is, that yep. is a whole paradigm shift. But, 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 I, I, but revival came because this was close to the heart of God. Right. <laughs> so God many cares. revivals today that I've been to, they, they turned into like, a, 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 oh, going to have a fun time, you know. Uh, but my friends, if we want real revival, we, we need to have our, our heart and our thinking lined up with God's heart and his thinking, what's on his mind. And that's what it means to seek the face of God. Go ahead, Sue. I, I, well, I, I want to hear your input. This, this paradigm shift, I think, is a real key to seeing revival true biblical revival yes yes because god we hear the word group think today well yeah everything's group group community group but god cares about each individual 
Yes, he does. He, and when individual hearts are changed, those individuals change the culture around them. And as the, the values of the kingdom of heaven are in individual hearts, and those individuals re reach, what do they call it, critical mass, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there is a culture that is full of the values and life of heaven. Right. Good so point. It, it's Amen. about the individual heart. Mm -hmm. And I think, I really believe that was a key to this great yep. prayer awakening. Amen, Sue. And it's a key today that yes. paradigm shift yeah. is Amen. critical. Amen. That's why I believe this is such an important yes, yes. message Absolutely. that you're sharing. Absolutely. Okay, I just okay. wanted to really hammer yeah, that yeah, one I, home. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that input. And, and this, is, this is an interactive thing that we're doing. Uh, Sue... And I, we were free to interact here, and you're free to give your comments and and questions and things there. So, so this is an interactive thing we're doing. This is not me just preaching a sermon. Uh, this is an interactive thing. So, so don't be surprised if we interact here spontaneously, and you feel free to interact and share comments. But they were praying specifically. The concern was all these new immigrants coming in, and they begin to pray for them, pray that they would come to know Christ. Now, there, there is an immigration crisis all over the world. The United States, the government here is partially shut down because of a crisis on the southern border. And, and, and Europe is having an immigration crisis. And just one thing that I want to say from, from this, let's begin to pray, whatever country you're in, but, you know, we're here in America. Let's start to pray for all of the immigrants coming into this country pray that they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior every time you see a woman with her head covered in Walmart or, or, or out in public pray specifically for her that she will come to know Jesus Christ and find the freedom that only he can give I believe that if the church rose up and begin to pray like this, no telling what would happen because it is so close to the heart of the Son of God who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Eddie, when I was um, a kid at home, we traveled to Ontario to Toronto mm -hmm. a lot, Boston, Toronto, Montreal. That was, that was what we did as a family. Well, I had not been in Toronto for many years as an adult. Mm. When you and I went to Toronto, I don't know, was it maybe uh, 20 years ago now? Perhaps, yeah. I was shocked. The whole city was full of immigrants. Mm. Where was my country? Where were my people? They just were overcome by the masses of immigrants. And I guess right now there are over a hundred languages spoken in, in Toronto. And I thought, oh, where is my country? This is so distressing. But then I, I thought, well, you know, apparently we as the church have not gone to these people and mm -hmm. God is sending them to right. us, yeah, yeah. That's boy. That's God I is believe sending that. them to us. I believe that. And our and the question is, are we doing His will in reaching these individuals? Right. That's to me the question. Yeah, yeah. That's good, Sue. Um, our Carmel says, "What is revival?" Uh, it just popped up here. Okay. Well, okay. Well, do you want to take a side? Uh, no, just no, quick... no. But I'll answer the question in the sequence here, Carmel. The, I, I think the answer, the question, will be answered as we and go along not, here. And if not, if not, we'll we'll get to it at the yeah. conclusion. Okay, Eddie. I just wanted to share that important, what I think is very yeah, important because it's happening today. Mm -hmm. All oh, in so many nations, yeah. not just America and Ireland, but yeah. so many nations. Yeah. And and only the church can can handle this. Can, can bring the ultimate answer, which is Jesus Christ, which is the values of the Word of God, the values of the kingdom of God. That, that is the ultimate answer. Now, Carmel, thank you for that question, and that's going to come forth, but I, I, I would like for it to come forth sort of in the flow as we go along talking about this. And so Jeremiah Lanfear, the first day he had four people, and he was going to do a weekly thing. So the next week, actually 20 people showed up the next week. 
And, and, and there seemed to be a sense of God's blessing on it. The third week, there was 40 people showed up, and there was such a sense of God's blessing as they prayed that they decided to make it a daily thing. And as they began to pray daily, that room, it filled up full, overflowing. They had to open doors to adjoining rooms. Those rooms opened up, hundreds of people crowding in, and finally, it was standing room only. Now, here's something very interesting. It was a very simple format for the meeting and very punctual. Everything about this revival, and we're going to define revival, was simple. The leadership was simple. Even when it became nationwide and thousands, hundreds of thousands being impacted, the, the, the leadership was still primarily simply lay people and not famous pastors or revivalists. Charles Finney was still living at the time, still ministering, but he had no role in the revival. And he, even he said, made this statement, he said that ministers seem to be laid aside, seem to be laid in the shade. And, and he said both men and women, we're here in the International Women's Hall of Fame, so I want, to, I want to emphasize this. Charles Finney said that both male and female were involved in the leadership of this revival. I'm just going to read what he said here. Uh, his autobiography was probably written around... Um, late 1860s, early 1870s. I believe it was 1873 when he died. And so when he wrote this, it was only a few years after this, this great awakening. And he said, uh, this revival is of so recent date that I need not enlarge upon it because it became almost universal throughout the northern states. A divine influence seemed to pervade the whole land. Okay, there's a description of revival. A divine influence seemed to pervade the whole land. It wasn't a religious meeting that somebody organized and got up. In response to the prayers of the people, there was Put your hand out. an invasion of God that came down. And Charles Finney said that a divine presence seemed to pervade not just a church building or a meeting, but he said the whole land. He went on to say, as I have said, it was carried on very much through the instrumentality of prayer meetings, personal visitation and conversation by the distribution of tracts, and by the energetic efforts of the laity, male and female. And let me interject there, Eddie. We talked about this as well. Char at this time, women finally were allowed to speak and pray in public. Charles Finney was one of the people who broke through. Right. And he was condemned by many church people for allowing women to speak and to pray publicly in his meetings. Um, I think it's very significant that this prayer meeting happened at a time when women were finally allowed to speak and to pray publicly right. and in groups. Mm. Um, also, we recognize that Phoebe Palmer, who many of you have heard us share about, she was instrumental in this particular uh, outpouring, coming of the presence, the tangible presence of God and, and prayer time. Uh, in fact, you told me that she had a very significant meeting in, is it Burlington? Hamilton, Ontario. Hamilton, yeah. Ontario. Uh -huh. And that's, that's in the book. That's yeah. in the new book. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so this is significant that it was a time, I'll hammer it again, it was a time when women had been finally were allowed to take, to have a, a public voice in prayer. This, this, isn't this incredible? We, we take it for granted today in most places. Okay. And so the, the prayer meeting there on Fulton Street in New York City, hundreds of people full, standing room only. They're, they seem to be drawn by a magnet. But now think about this. And, 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 and incredible, the unsaved are drawn in. They're praying for the unconverted. And it's not just Christians coming to pray, but now they're praying for these unbelievers. And all of a sudden, unbelievers start coming. Uh, by the, it seems by the droves as though they're being drawn into this meeting. 
Now let me tell you about the format. Very simple, very, very uh, punctual. Jeremiah Lanfear or someone else, another business person that he would appoint. You could, in a sense, this was like the first full gospel businessmen's, you know, which was a very popular movement back in the 1970s and 80s. But he would open with a one or two verses from a well-known hymn that people would sing. There would be an opening prayer. And then the leader would read prayer requests. And then at that time, he would throw it open. So no, they didn't have a special speakers. They would throw it open. Anyone could pray. They could give an exhortation. They could give a praise report. But they could not go more than five minutes. That was a rule. They had a five-minute rule. Nobody can go more than five minutes. And the leader had a bell. And if somebody got up and got carried away and exceeded their five minutes, the leader would ring the bell, which was a sign that you've got to sit down, bring your, bring your prayer, bring your comments to a conclusion. <laughs> and so, so there were many people. And see, men and women, everyone was free to pray, give an exhortation. And, and it seemed that the presence and the power of God just seemed to descend upon this prayer meeting. The, the, the presence of God was just so very real. And uh, one thing that happened, there was a very notorious criminal, well-known criminal in New York City. His nickname was Awful Gardener. He was drawn into this prayer meeting and was gloriously saved and transformed. He went back to Sing Sing Prison where he had served time and gave his testimony to the prisoners there and caused a great uh, upturning move of God in Sing Sing Prison. Uh, an, another testimony that I read, there was a man that was drawn in to the meeting. He was in a state of turmoil and, and, uh, and anger and wrath. And he had determined that he was going to kill a certain woman and then commit suicide. He came into the meeting in that state, drawn, he didn't know why, but drawn into this meeting. And during the meeting, uh, some, one, of the, one of the many people there was standing up and they were giving an exhortation just spontaneously as they were moved on by the Spirit about the need for repentance. And this man was sitting there and he was, his heart was so pierced by those words and by the convicting power of God's Spirit that he suddenly cried out, Oh, what must I do to be saved? At that point, another man stood up who was not a Christian. He had grown up in a Christian home, but he had wandered far away. But he had been drawn into the meeting. And right at this point, he stands up weeping. And he remembers an old hymn that it is so impressed upon his mind. And he says through tears, can we sing Rock of Ages Clef for me? And so the hundreds of prayers there, they break forth spontaneously <laughs> singing Rock of Ages Clef for me. And those two men are converted right there on the spot. And so a mighty work of God taking place through this very simple prayer meeting. Actually, there were pastors who began attending and seeing the, the passion and the desire for people to pray, they opened their churches and they were amazed when their churches filled up with people wanting to pray and pour out their hearts to God. And it seemed that a spirit of prayer was unleashed from that Fulton Street prayer meeting in New York City across the nation. And similar prayer meetings began springing up. Uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Chicago, Indianapolis, down in North Carolina, Boston. And, and, and many of them, they carried on uh, with that same format, that same punctuality, the noon prayer meetings, and with business people coming and filling it up for, for prayer. And, um, and, and then it became common to see in New York City, Boston, Washington, D.C., the major cities and smaller cities, it was common to see posters on businesses, downtown businesses saying, uh, closed for the noon prayer meeting. <laughs> 
And, uh, and then it was such an incredible thing that newspapers begin to carry it. Front page stories in, in major newspapers throughout America, this, this strange thing, this strange phenomena that is happening that, that churches, that uh, uh, fire stations, auditoriums, halls, secular halls, they are being filled up at noon. People are coming and spending their noon hour instead of eating, they're praying. And they're praying for the lost and for the unsaved. And let me just read a, a sampling, if I could, of some of the, the kind of front page headlines. New Haven, Connecticut. City's biggest church packed twice daily for prayer. That was a headline. City's biggest church packed twice daily for prayer. Another Connecticut city, Bethel, Connecticut, a headline was business shuts down for our businesses shut down for our each day. Everybody prays. In Albany, New York, the capital of the state of New York, the headline read, State Legislators Get Down on Knees. Um, Newark, New Jersey, which is a part of the New York City uh, metro area, a headline read, Firemen's Meeting Attracts 2,000. A headline in a Washington, D.C. newspaper, Five Prayer Meetings Go Round the Clock. And in New Haven, Connecticut, the home of Yale University, uh, a headline read, Revival Sweeps Yale. And what is revival? It's when God's Spirit, God sovereignly comes on the scene and things begin to happen that is obvious to any observer that this is not something that some religious committee got together and decided that they were going to do. This is not the result of some human scheme or plan. This is not just an exciting religious meeting. This is a work of Almighty God that cannot be explained by natural causes. And so, again, this revival, it didn't have all of the things that we talk about so much today. It was very simple led by simple lay people, <laughs> men and women. It was focused on prayer, and the meetings were very simple and very punctual. Now, there were prayer meetings at other times, the noon prayer meetings, but in the churches in the evening, sometimes the prayer meetings would go for hours. And here's something very interesting and powerful. Down in, uh, I believe it, it's in North Carolina, let me turn over and read this because it is so powerful. Um, there was a church in Charleston, South Carolina that had been built for slaves. Slave owners gave permission and they even contributed to the building of this church building for slaves. The pastor was uh, John Gerdo, wh whom according to the sources I, I found was also a black man. And in 1858, John Gordeaux established a prayer meeting and he exhorted his congregation, composed primarily of black slaves, to pray and wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pray and wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The prayer service grew until the auditorium was overflowing with more than 2,000 people. So other people began to come to it. They heard that something was happening there. As on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit suddenly fell upon the, those at the Anson Street Church. And this is one description of what happened. They began to sob softly like the falling of rain, then with deeper emotion to weep bitterly or to rejoice loudly according to their circumstances. It was midnight before he could dismiss the congregation. The meeting went on night and day for weeks. Large numbers of both black and white were converted and joined churches in the city. This is what Finney was talking about when he said a divine influence seemed to pervade the whole land. Finney estimated, or let me say this, Finney was in ministering in Boston at the time, and this is very interesting. Finney, 
Finney's great revivals primarily were in the 1820s and 30s that you read about in his autobiography and people who have written them biographies of him talk about. He was still ministering, but he, he wasn't seeing the results, and he, he tells about it in this autobiography that I read from earlier. He was in Boston, and there was a lots of opposition to his ministry in Boston. And he tells about the man he was staying with decided that he was going to start a prayer meeting. And Finney said uh, a lot of people didn't think they would have any success in Boston. He said, but he, he got the uh, facilities of what he called the Old South Church. And, and Finney said everyone was amazed. It immediately filled up with people, and people began to come from all over the city to pray. So, and, and Finney said people, obviously, they desired meetings for prayer rather than regular church meetings to hear preaching. Finney said the, the attitude of the people seemed to be, we have heard preaching until we're hardened. We must pray. And so this great prayer awakening swept across the land. Finney said during their meeting in Boston, he said a man stood up in the meeting and said, I have just arrived from Omaha, Nebraska. He had traveled for 2,000 miles. And he said, I have found a continuous 2,000 mile long prayer meeting going on all the way from Omaha, Nebraska here to Boston, Massachusetts. My friends, God was obviously doing something. Finney said that at the height of the revival, he estimated that 50,000 people were being converted every week. 50,000 being converted every week. How did this start? With a great revivalist? With somebody hearing an audible voice from heaven? No, a simple layperson had a thought who was burdened and concerned for the lost. <laughs> and he had a thought, why not invite people, business people, to take off their noon hour and come and pray for the lost and the unsaved. That's how this great prayer awakening began. There is no question in my mind, and I'm, I, I'm not going to go into the detail in my book, but there is no question in my mind that this prayer awakening is what really ended slavery and saved America from absolutely disintegrating and falling apart because it was after the great prayer awakening that the Civil War broke out. And, um, but the prayer meeting even though we use the words 1857-58, that just simply describes the time when it was at its height and have its greatest impact. But the prayer revival continued, and there were prayer meetings in both the, the, the southern armies and the northern armies. The great historian Mark Knoll from Wheaton College, he has found evidence, he says, that there were revivals in both northern and southern armies. And you say, how could such be going on when people are fighting? Oh, maybe we don't know the depth of the mercy and grace of God. But let me tell you something. I will read this of what happened. It wasn't going well for the Union Army. The, Conf the Southern Confederacy was winning battle after battle, and things were not looking good. And it was at this time that the, the United States Senate asked Abraham Lincoln, the president, to call for a day of repentance and prayer. Not for a moment of silence, my friends. I'm okay with a moment of silence, but my friends, there are things that a moment of silence will not cure, will not help. And what I want you to see was that Abraham Lincoln and the, the, the people of this time, they believed in the power of God. Yes, much of the nation had not lived up to the Christian standard. There had been a whole lot of indifference, but at least the Christian moral standard was there for people to be called to come back to. And so Abraham Lincoln, I'm just going to read it over. He wrote up a resolution, a proclamation for a national day of repentance, or what he called humiliation, of fasting and prayer. 
And I may just read it all. It is so powerful, especially in the light of today, how we have veered so far from a real unashamed commitment to the biblical message. And Abraham Lincoln, some people, some historians have said he's not a Christian because he never joined a, a, a church. But in what research I have done, the man was a man of great faith and had a relationship with God and believed in God. And he says, whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations, has by resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. In other words, humbling ourselves and recognizing we have failed you, O God. He says, and whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men, and he's using the word men generically, talking about people, to own or to recognize their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. And so he's calling upon the nation to repent for the, the institutional sin of slavery is what he's doing here. And he says, and to recognize the sub sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures. These are his words. He was an avid reader of the Bible. Announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is Lord. He says, and inasmuch as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisement in this world, may we not justly fear that awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. He goes on and says, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. I tell you, his words would be appropriate for America today and many other countries too. He says, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. And there is some more there, but I, I will close with that. It's interesting. This came on the heels of the great prayer awakening. So this spirit of prayer was still there. But let me say this. I, I want to, uh, he asked the people to set aside their normal duties. He says, I do therefore request all the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to this solemn occasion. And so the people responded in mass. There was, especially in the north, there was everywhere businesses closed down. People gathered together in homes, halls, churches, and prayed and sought God and humiliated before God and repented of their sins. There was an immediate turn in the war because it looked like that the, the nation was going to be divided, it would be the end of the American Union. But immediately after this day of a national day of prayer and repentance, there was a change in the course of the war, but not before one final test. About two months after this, a confident General Robert E. Lee led 76,000 Confederate troops north into Union territory, into Pennsylvania. 
The populace was terrified, and there was much panic. Lincoln, however, having been impacted by the prayer revival, found solace in prayer. And these are own words how he responded. He said, when everyone seemed panic-stricken, I went to my room and got down on my knees before Almighty God and prayed. Soon a sweet comfort crept into my soul that God Almighty had taken the whole business into his own hands. The Confederate forces were defeated at Gettysburg on July the 4th, and that battle proved to be the turning point for the war. It was also the occasion of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, one of the most significant speeches ever delivered by a, uh, a national leader. One more thing I want to say about Lincoln. It was at the, at the onset of the war, both sides were claiming God was on their side. And a northern minister in conversation with Lincoln said, I hope that God is on our side. And here's a principle we must all incorporate, never forget. Lincoln said, I am not concerned about that at all. But my concern for myself and for this nation is that I and this nation will always be on the Lord's side. <laughs> oh, forget about going around claiming God's on our side. The question is, are we on his side? And that's what it means to seek the face of the Lord which is one of the conditions of a national healing, a national awakening, 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves, that's what Abraham Lincoln called the nation to do, humble themselves, lower themselves, admit how much they need God. That's what humility is. Humility is not groveling and beating up yourself. It's merely in meeting, admitting that in our humanity, all of us, we desperately need God. We need his help. We need his spirit. We need his wisdom, his empowering presence. To humble ourselves before God is to admit how much we need God. We'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Pray and seek my face. Seek God's face means that we're not just praying to get God to come over and do what he wants us to do but to seek God's face means that we move his priorities we move his interests at the top of the list that now we pray we want to know his heart we want to know his mind we want to know that we're praying according to his will and praying what's on his heart and praying what's on his mind we are seeking his face we want to know him and his ways. Not just wanting him to jump and do what we want him to do when we want, when, when we want him to do it. No, we want to know his heart and his ways. And God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I really believe that with all my heart, that we in America, that you in Canada, Ireland, England, wherever anyone is watching this and will see the video, God's not through. God's not through with Ireland. He's not through with England. He's not through with Canada. He's not through with Bulgaria or whatever nation you may be listening to. God's, God's not through yet. God's not through. We're still here. And God can do great and mighty things. And he doesn't need anything sensational. He doesn't need we, don't need, we don't need a new prophet, a new impartation. We don't need a new apostolic council. We don't need some new anointing, some new impartation. <laughs> oh, let's go back and look at how this great revival started. Very simply, a simple individual who had a burden and a concern for the many people coming into his city that did not know Christ. And he invited other people to join him in praying for the conversion of lost souls. 
And I'll say it again, that's very near to the heart of God. For the Son of Man, he said, came to seek and to save that which was lost. They started a very simple meeting where everyone could be involved. And I will close with this. This is very powerful because God wants to use everyone watching me in a powerful way, in ways you haven't even experienced. Finney said of this revival that one of the peculiar features, he said the ministers seemed to, for the most part, was laid in the shade and it was carried on by lay people, both men and women, both male and female. One of the people impacted in this revival was a young D.L. Moody, who in the latter part, who years later, became America's most successful revivalist, evangelist, had incredible meetings in America, and I know in England, and I don't know where else he may have gone, I think also in Canada. D.L. Moody's name is very well known today. D.L. Moody, as a young man, was impacted by this prayer revival. He went to the prayer meetings in Chicago, and, uh, and he wrote to his mother. Uh, he said something like this. He said, oh, how I do love these prayer meetings. He says, it seems as though God himself is present. And again, I'm talking about these prayer meetings. They were led by lay people for the most part. And it's very interesting that D.L. Moody never sought ordination. <laughs> never sought ordination. No doubt because of what he observed, of how he observed God using those nameless, faceless people. To, to us, there's a multitude. They never became famous as far as as to be written down in history. But this revival, never forget, was led by an army of ordinary, nameless, faceless people, both men and women. And God can do it again. God can do it again. Now, we can't take what they did as a strict model and try to emulate that. No, we have to seek the Lord. Now, I have to close with this. At the beginning of our marriage together and ministry, God gave us, and it goes right along with this, Amos chapter 5, verse 5, seek the Lord and live. And God said to us, don't go over here and try to duplicate what somebody else is doing. If you just try to emulate and duplicate what somebody else is doing, it will not have eternal value. But seek the Lord and you will live. If you will seek me and let everything that you do flow out of your relationship with me, then what you do will have consequences for all eternity. And so, folks, let's seek the Lord. God has much more that he's, he, that he's willing to do. They're in Athlone, they're in Belenisloe, they're in London, they're in, I may be talking to somebody in, in Shillong, India today, some friends in Shillong, maybe in, in Lahore, Pakistan. We have friends there that, that sometimes come on. Oh, don't limit what God wants to do. And you don't have to have some kind of great sensational something to step out. No, if you've got a heart, if you're concerned, and you pray and you seek the Lord, and maybe like Jeremiah Lanfear, it's just you. Go ahead and step out. Who knows what your small step of obedience may lead to. Uh, Eddie, um, uh, Margaret in uh, Ireland says, Sometimes I have a great longing to pray, but find it difficult to get down to it. Has anyone got suggestions? Um, I, I know when the, when the disciples asked, there's so much here. Prayer to me, and I'm speaking personally, I've been involved in intercessory prayer groups and whatever, mm. but I remember when I was a teenager and uh, I had a little chord organ, I, I could read music with my the treble, but then I had buttons I would push to add the the rest of it, and I would open my 
Anglican hymn book and uh, just sing away. And one of the ones I remember was began this way. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. Oh, I should look that hymn up and get the full scoop on it. But that part I remember, and it, it's so helpful because I don't believe that prayer is a religious exercise. Mm. It is for the Muslims. It is for many Christians. It's a religious exercise. But real, what we're talking about, I believe, Eddie, mm -hmm. is simply that recognition that God is with us, He's He's in us. He's, but He's bigger than we are. Yeah. There are two words that I've heard you use in relation to He's imminent and He's uh, transcendent. Transcendent, and we need to keep those two things in mind. He's imminent in that He's always with us, but He's transcendent in that He's bigger and much more yeah. than we are. Right. So. We know that he has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And we know that we have this saving relationship with him and that he cares about us. And so for me, prayer has just become this kind of normal flow of <laughs> communication. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the spirit comes up. Sometimes, to yeah. To pray in yeah. ways that you didn't know was going to happen. Yeah. And but but I don't determine that, right? right? I just, mm -hmm. you know, driving around, praise the Lord, you know, oh God, bless so-and-so. Oh Lord, meet the need of so-and-so. Lord, would you intervene for that person? Right now. See, it's just this, <laughs> even as I'm talking about it, it's happening, you see. It, you know, it's just, it's yeah. just this, it's like, um, Eddie, you and I are married. We have an intimate relationship. Right. I can count on you. You can count on me. Now, I need your help here. Yeah, you got it. And so I don't have to have a lot of um, pat statements that I, you know, oh, Eddie, I want to talk to you, you know, I and go through some religious ceremony to do it. And that would be so boring and monotonous and... Who would want that? Well, God doesn't want it either. In our relationship with him, he just wants that non-religious, just that intimate communication, just that sharing of our hearts. It's so unburdensome. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I understand how easy it would be to get tired and not want to pray. That is, not want that, re have to execute that religious exercise that's not that's not what we're talking about You're talking is it about prayer as a just part of a way life. of life it's as just natural as breathing uh, yeah now now I, there's also I